Ugas, mm. first and foremost, I need to thank you for the history that you're presenting oh, to gosh. Kenyans. Yeah, man. I feel like it's up above. As, in, as, as <laughs> I was explaining, I love how your story, you enter with your story and your experience and how you, you fit into that story. And then you give us a 360 landscape of what was happening and how the different pieces fit. Yeah, yeah. You get? <laughs> so it's like, it's like you are, you've got a third eye in that, in that room. Uh, it's, it's again your photographic memory. Yeah, yeah, remember yeah. A, lot, a lot of names, a lot of what was in, happening. In details, yeah. yeah. So, it's, it's a blessing. Uh, and at this time, we haven't even reached your movie directing. But no, at the no, same time, coming. you're laying a foundation. Let, yeah. me just say, let me just say that you're laying a foundation, which for me is important so that guys understand. By the time you're hearing Mugash is directing a movie, yeah? and that, that is now in cinemas, that you need to go watch. <laughs> you get? Yeah. Uh, this is where it started from. Mm. It's been. Dude, years, mm. years in the making. <laughs> yeah, it has. <laughs> Decades in the making. Started at age five, and now you're in our late thirties. Okay, let's keep let's keep this story going okay. at at the pace that you're going. So you talked about going to watch this thing at KCCT, and what you had gone to see was the beginning of a couple of movements where churches were coming together from like mass evangelism, mass evangelistic. Um, drives like let's 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 win over to Christ people over to Christ as much as possible, and they were operating under this idea that Christianity is not boring. That's what you'd hear a lot of people say. Mm -hmm. Christianity is not boring. Christianity is not boring. You know, it's not boring anymore. Nice, cool, and funky, and hip, and then you can come and join and join a family and stop all those vices that you're involved in and go to heaven. You won't go to hell and you'll be cool. That was a movement, you know. That was what people were trying to go after. So churches were coming together to put together events that were actually of really high production value, but were overall very cool as well. Mm -hmm. And so no Christian event now could hata a DJ, even if it was just that one DJ. Yes. But so by, by most going out and becoming mainstream, then he started inspiring a lot of other young people, one of whom we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, so one of these events, one of these events was called Acquire the Fire. We're going into the new millennium. People are a bit worried about Y2K. People are wondering if the world is going to end. And a public, oh, ah, yes. And how do I forget? Of course, by this point, family media has launched. <laughs> so suddenly there's a broadcast medium that exists on radio and on TV that's really popular, that caters quite a bit to both people of an older generation and a younger generation through which a lot of information can be disseminated. Now if you can remember, Baptist was the home of coolness, Nairobi Baptist Church. Yes. And Nairobi it's Baptist where Church... where people started, yeah, that's where Fiverr Life started. Fiverr started there, yeah, yes, I didn't know. So Bapo became the sort of center for the organization of Acquire the Fire. And that meant that this mass choir that was being put together would be rehearsing in Bapo. So I think I found out from a friend who goes to Bapo, how can we get involved in this choir? Now Bapo used to throw a lot of cool concerts. At the end of every year they had three consecutive concerts. There was the Light Concert, which was the Young Teens, there was the Gap Concert, and there was another one. I can't remember which one. But Light and Gap, those are the two concerts that you never missed. Mm -hmm. Light introduced us to the talents of CK, who's a personal friend of mine, Karol Kyoko, and now produces films. So yes. we've sort of gone in the same direction. But it also introduced the talent of another dancer, who we didn't know was a singer. I'll tell you who that person was. When we were doing our rehearsal for the mass choir, for, for Acquire the Fire, which was the big concert that was going to be thrown uh, at the Nairobi University grounds that was being co-sponsored by Family Media. And which in my estimation was one of the biggest Christian events I attended at, up until that point because it was an open air event and the estimates of the number of people that showed up for that concert was about 5,000 people. It's at Nairobi grounds? Nairobi University grounds. Uh -huh, yeah. It's the first time I saw speakers being stacked on a crane. I'd never seen that before. I'd never seen speakers that big. Now, once again, the production value was not that big, but the intention behind it was huge. I remember equipment was going off every so often. A lot of rehearsals could still have been held that weren't held. It was a lot of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. However, 
we were part of this mass choir. So um so speaker stacked nini nini nini. Ni, ni. Yes, a and few, then this mass choir. Here, there, and, there. and then this mass choir. And uh and 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 this this person who had always imagined to be a dancer. Okay, so this is how the mass choir operated. They were going to select a couple. We were going to sing a lot of covers, mm -hmm. and then we're going to sing back up for a lot of the headlining acts, one of whom was Peter Dera. So he taught us the song, Revive Us, O oh Lord, cause us to see you again, Revive Our Land. We loved that song. And we were going to perform a song by New Direction called Who Do You Roll With? And they needed soloists for that. So Sarah Oyungu, who was a choir director, um, elder sister of Atemi Oyungu, uh, conducted a really quick audition to find who the lead singers would be for this song, Who Do You Roll With? And the, pers the person that she picked as the male vocalist was a friend of mine called Chris, Cristiano. And I can't remember who she picked as the lady, but I remember the person that came second because it came down to acclamation. And the person that came second, who also had a wonderful voice, but who unfortunately didn't end up doing the solo, was a girl called Sarah. Mitaru. <laughs> Sarah Mitaru didn't end up singing the solo. Uh -huh. But that was the first time I saw her sing, and I'm like, wow, I always knew her as a dancer because she was one of the cool dancer chicks yes. in, uh, in Papo. And I, I believe that's when we met the first time. It was pretty cool, man. So we ended up doing Nairobi to the, uh, this Acquire the Fire and then that led to an even bigger concert which happened at Nairobi Stadium which was called Nairobi 2000 and that's the one that you, your friend called you to. Uh -huh. Yes, it started with a youth leader conference at KCCT and then went to Nairobi Stadium. My friend at that time being Jal. Your friend being Jal. Girl was in Amazing. slippers, now he's Uko flying around the world <laughs> and meeting and saying hi to Bono like they are. <laughs> like their boys. <laughs> Man, yeah. That's insane. And and then a few months after that, now I joined. I actually joined all over as an associate member and learned the choreography. And then this very adventurous two years, I think, two and a half years with all over happened. And at this time, you now officially move into university. Yeah. I'm, I'm, so I'm, when, I'm did, in, when did you start university? 99, 99 of... 1999. Well, it was technically the year 2000. Okay. Yeah. After acquire the fire, that was my second semester. Okay. Mm. Let's let's talk now about this season in in USIU because yeah. it's another crazy season that it is that that leads you into modeling into other things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We can talk about that. Okay. <laughs> um. So I join I join USIU. We do acquire the fire. Um. And. I'd come off of this work that we're doing with Faith Evangelistic Ministry. Sote is now pretty much defunct because we've been absorbed in, into all over. And I remember at USIU wanting to really represent the gospel. That's what it was about. I was like, I need to stand up and represent Jesus and I can't backslide and I'll do whatever it is that I can to hold on to the faith and still, you know, be a representative for Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. Like, it sounds so strange. I, I haven't talked like this in so long. So I'm like, this is all strange. <laughs> but it was at that point by... about Around April of, of the year 2000 is when I joined all over. Learned the choreography and now soon became a bona fide member of the group. And it was at this point, all over was still pretty early, but we were making such an impact you were the biggest Such dance group an in the impact. country or even not saying the region gospel dance group in the region we were the biggest gospel but, dance but, group but actually no we were the biggest dance, dance group. group yes biggest most popular everybody who was anybody in the entertainment industry learned who all over was because we were always showing up before a headlining act or after and if an artist was you know by the side they'd be watching and being like, yo, what's up with that? Who are these guys? Mm -hmm. Now, remember those people like Stompers who were, doing, who were dancing with, um, with ICC? There was a lot of very strong church groups. Uh, Lighthouse Church had City Lights, but none of them, all of them were still affiliated to a church somehow. Olova was not affiliated to any church. Mm -hmm. Olova was just a free-running ministry on its own. So we were able to play pretty much anywhere. 
The first time I actually saw Olova perform in a secular venue was at at Mr. and Miss USAU in 1999, which was my first Mr. and Miss USAU. And Mr. and Miss USAU was the biggest event on the USAU calendar. It was huge because it was a beauty pageant, but it wasn't just that. It was also a variety show. That's when we got to see a lot of the new talent that was coming out of USIU. There were open slots for performances. So I remember going to Oscar and asking him, yo, dude, would you be interested in performing at Mr. and Miss USIU? And he was like, sure. What do they require? Now think about it this way. Olova was still not as big as Mr. USA, Mr. and Miss USIU at that point. Yeah. In fact, USIU would be doing Olova a favor to have them come and perform. Mm -hmm. Um, so he showed up for one rehearsal. So, exposure. Yeah, it is that kind of thing, exposure. Um, so he came for one um, rehearsal and we attended the rehearsal together, Oscar and I. And it was the first time I was watching a Mr. and Mr. Mr. and Miss USAU rehearsal and I'm like, this is actually pretty cool, man. And everyone is coming on and putting, putting on some pretty cool performances. Who knows? Maybe. Nah, never. So Lova ends up performing at the first Mr. and Miss USAU. And you being part of the I wasn't part of them. I didn't join them at this point. Okay. I just facilitated their performing at it. Okay. And actually, yes, I talked to the school, me there being my first, like, first freshman semester, and talked to them and said, hey, there's these guys, this group of dancers, would you like them to come and perform? And they're like, yeah, we need to see them first because we've had dancers show up on this stage and they weren't very good. And so Oscar came up and did a really quick audition and it was very good so soon they were performing so by early 2000 now i'm part of all over and we're playing everywhere can i ask a question yeah well you keep mentioning oscar is this the same oscar who now is sarah Cassie? no no this is the oscar who went with there's ian yes and oscar oscar, oscar. and ian were the two oscar he used to go by the name oscar B ba by that point everyone knew him as oscar ba and ian mm -hmm. those are the two founding members. They both came from Cornerstone and then founded mm -hmm. Olova. Oscar does a lot of salsa now. Yeah, yeah, he's based in the US now. He does, he's, he's a DJ, but he's also a, you know, professional dance instructor now. Okay. So a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of salsa, ballroom dancing. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's Ian and Kuku who went to become Wairi's dancers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and they also Kuku, formed was, a group was, on their own. Yes, was Kuku also in Olova? Yes, he was. Kuku was also in Olova? Yes, he was. I mean, all over, Yanni. So he you was. guys, literally, you are what I'd say heart was to to buffing a lot of other uh, explosion of the industry. Yes, a lot of all over went on to become um, dance people. Catherine, do you know? There was, there was, I don't know if there was ever a chick called Catherine was in. I remember Kathy. Kathy. Kathy Kilonzo. Yes, Kathy. Was she? No, she wasn't. She wasn't in. Okay. But she she was one of those that paved the way. Because mm -hmm. when when Hart and when Peter Darren Hart and Soul were performing at the Magical Christmas thing where I saw Cornerstone for the first time, Kathy was one of the members. Another member was Brian Judah. Ah. Yeah, Brian Judah was one of the members of Hart and Soul, and these guys were doing a lot of cool dance, really cool dance moves. And it was still, in retrospect, it was very simple, but we still hadn't seen bodies that. bodies moving that way in Christian spaces. Okay, with such professionalism and grace and um so but so you have more than one or two or three members who went out to pursue dance as a career yes from from uh, from are, this from this all over yeah yeah uh we don't have as many people who contribute to the scene as you as rap community for instance because mm -hmm. rap community went from being musicians to being event organizers exactly to, it's like yeah you guys just owned the music industry um but or the events industry but we were more of we were very ministry centric now oscar had been hanging out a lot with the members of rap community and when there was a few falling outs within rap community or a lot of people going leaving and becoming secular musicians Manyake. Uh, short circuit yeah, short, <laughs> short circuit became became circuit yeah and then released that song with joel called Manyake. Come up, rises. When you're gay, come up, losing a mind.
Ndiyo mwanya case I'm chicks and sour definitely not a mnyanye Mlojo kitu tembele ya wase This is what they care when they will say Kwa chef mwanya rere, kwa chef mwanya rere um, Oscar did, was determined that we wouldn't go in a similar direction, that mm -hmm. we wouldn't fall off the gospel path. So, so there was a lot of ministry to... The dance came second, ministry was first. I hear it. Yeah, ministry was the first thing. But unfortunately, when you start to get legalistic a certain way, everything can become a little bit militant. And this is the and mindset couldn't last very long. I get now when you say this is a mindset that you sort of entered USIU with. Yes. All of us knew that we were part of an army, that it was battle. It was a battle of good versus evil. And secular was evil and gospel was good. And so we were, we could get a little bit militant, which in retrospect, I'm, I'm regretful about because, you know, we didn't go out and live. You know, we didn't, we didn't experience life. We were so busy where the army were winning people over to Christ. So, you know, by the time I was Halfway through my first year, uh -huh. of, no, pretty much coming to my first year, of, at the end of first year of VSIU, uh, I was performing just as regularly as the next All Over member. And we would gig a lot. We would have at least two or three gigs every weekend for about a year and a half. But during these gigs, we got to meet so many people. And it's like we had front row tickets to a lot of the movements that were start, that were st that were continuing from what Audio Vault and them started. Uh -huh. um, I mean, I'll give you a few examples. Um, oh, and wait, before I do that, the other thing that was happening was we were seeing how Christian ministry was becoming bigger and more assertive and more. There was there seemed to be more and more ambition from the church as to how we can just keep winning people over and over mm -hmm. you know christian music has become very mainstream now but i can tell you about a time when it wasn't i mean like this this whole thing about gospel being the mainstream thing that it is is very it's still quite new but when we were starting out gospel music was still that other thing that people didn't listen to and any gospel music that made it into the mainstream was more of the exception than the rule. Yep. Yeah. So among the things, among the places that were able to perform... Did you do Beats of the Season? Yeah, we did Beats of the Season. That already is... Beats of the Season was huge. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about, for instance, when we... When Peter Dera... Peter Dera was releasing a worship project called Piercing the Veil and we were the we were the curtain raisers for that among the curtain raisers at that thing was a group that was based in California a Kenyan group that was based in California a four-man group that was led by this dude and I'll never forget when this dude walked into the room. Oh my God, this guy came in with an air, with an aura, such a self-assured coolness about himself. And he had like a box cut and a little tuft of hair. And that was, there was a, that was a style then when people were growing out their hair at the back. Yeah, so that they could grow it into a ponytail. And this guy was cool and he'd look everyone in the eye when he was talking to them. And he had this sort of... He was he had that Kenyan relatedness, but this sort of international like LA Swag. assuredness <laughs> to him. Him and the three other dudes he walked into the room with and were like, yo, that is the dude Kanji from Milele. And they're about to perform in Kenya for the first time. And that's the first time we saw them perform forever, Milele. Uh, standing all my life. And uh, uh, JC and Sanjo Lama. This was piercing the veil. And at the same time, there was this other vocalist, this young vocalist who had a song that sounded um, <clears throat> very, 
big it was a big skill song uh, called nakuitaji and her name was Henry Mutuku we had this version of the song and it was pretty cool but it's not the version that went mainstream because she went and did a, a remix and then that remix became the radio play single that everyone knows Henry Mutuku for and then after that Peter Dera came and performed piercing the veil and that was amazing at the same time we were doing that there was another event called Star Search the Man of Star Search that was organized by David Moravi and a few other people which I can't remember and we registered to perform at this event and because there were so many of us uh, the, w- what what happened with Star Search was that they split it into different categories there was the music category there was the R&B there was the, the the like main music category then there was a river road music category a dance category an acrobatics category and then after you were done with all those categories and you came together and you pitted all these guys against each other and they came up with one winner who would win some contract and a lot of celebrity attached things so we were competing in the dance section of it and we went in as two groups all minova and ianova so both of them were all over but there were two aspects of the all over dance group and i remember i was in all minova and all minova won its first round and ianova came second no ianova came third the group that came second uh-huh. was an all girl dance group their name was Raider and the name Raider was a uh, acronym of all the different, members yes. different members so my again my memory doesn't serve me correct but i believe the two a's were angela and angela were they i think so the r was for rabo i don't know remember what the d was for i don't but the three members of this group who won't forget because they were also pretty big in the theater scene at this point <laughs> was Angela Ndambuki Angela Mwandanda who's known to many as uh, Shinde. Shinde and Debbie Asila and then oh yeah so D yeah D Debbie Debbie Asila was the D and then R was someone called Rabo I think was it Rabo? I can't remember. I think it was Rabo. Hey, anyway, my memory doesn't serve me correct at that point. So suddenly, here is another group, another dance group, doing FYI, all secular. You've just mentioned the members of Tattoo. Yes. Oh yes, of course. <laughs> you can't leave that out. Oh yeah, yeah. You How just name forget? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Because these girls now went from singing; they were multifaceted. Like they were doing theatre because that's where they met and they were doing dancing and then afterwards they went into music and that's why their star couldn't be touched because they were beautiful and they were very multi-talented and they were very friendly and it was wonderful so that's why we met them for the first time and suddenly we realized hey here this competition but then anyway, we went into the dance final Olminova ended up winning it and then when we went into the final we lost to another group a group of singers the other one that won the overall star search challenge and this group was called Jawabu Jawabu yeah <laughs> Jawabu you and that's the first time we had the amazing. song Jawabu watafanya u dance 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 Le gusta este lugar pequeño, barato, bonito, caliente, caluroso, bueno, buena misa latino, española. Yo por su línea me ocupé, yo voy a hasta luego, si comprendo, por favor. Sé que esa, sé que esa, bien, en la fuga, y yo, señorita, solamente, adiós, tiene mi bien. Baila, baila conmigo, pote, ambos, le arme, por mi toca, adiós, a su hogar. And of course, you know the rest. Aka is Shaki and Ambrose. Yeah, Shaki and Ambrose. Yeah, was it Shaki? Was it the other guy called Ambrose? No, no. I remember I, I, Shaki. Yeah, yeah. Shaki. Shaki was the other guy. Wasn't called Ambrose. No, Ambrose, called Ambrose. Then Ambrose was, was the was, producer. Was, yeah, the producer and Shaki's brother. Yeah. Um, but I want to throw you back now into USIU. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Oh, so now, so, now. so by the point we're winning Star Search, mm. or by the point we had gotten to Star Search, we were pretty much well known all over. We'd performed at a lot of. Sorry about that. Um, so by this point, we'd been playing at a lot of events, gospel secular events. So within the Christian circles, we were very well known. Between the secular circles, we were very well known. Uh, we came this close to winning the title of, of Star Search, but. Of course, musicians had to win it because the winning prize was also fashioned around music. And then um, that's how we got the gig for Beats of the Season. Beat, Beats of the Season was, without a doubt, Kenya's biggest event. When I think about it, is that incorrect? No, it's not incorrect. Mm -hmm. It was huge. Beats of the Season happened every year, and it was a lot, a lot of local acts completed with a big African act. Mm -hmm. And the big African act at this point was Awilo Longomba. Ooh. Now, Olova... The bit of the season was organized by Susan Kibokosia. Was it? Yes. It wasn't even... I found, I, I found that out now when, when, you were when I interviewed, interviewed Susan. Her. So go watch the, go, go, go check out that interview. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, well, bits of the season was huge, dude. You knew bits of the season was coming. They received airplay. They were advertised on all the stations, even if the stations weren't that many. Um, they were on the newspapers, so you knew. And then Awilo Longomba was performing. I mean, that was huge, dude. The and father of the Longombas. Yes, uh, no, the uncle. The uncle of the, the uncle Longombas. of the Longombas. Yes. So uh, we were rehearsing for the beats of the season gig, but every so often. What would happen was a few select members of Olova would be would be chosen to perform for other gigs. And so we heard that a couple of performers were going to be were, were going to be rehearsing and doing some choreography for a musician who was doing his homecoming gig. He had just released an album called Sawa Sawa. <laughs> and everyone knew him because he was a member of Five Alive. But he was now going solo. He'd gone to the Berkeley School of Music and now was coming back, like he was making his huge comeback. And he was going to perform all this never heard before material. The only solo song we knew him for that point at this point was Kenya Only. We didn't even know about Mwananchi Mzalendo or the Kiswahili Daima Mimi in Kenya, whatever you want to call it, the Kiswahili version of this song, no. Kenya Only. He was going to perform songs for the first time like Sawa Sawa, which were being heard for the very first time on the beats of the season stage. And his backup dancers were members of Olova. That's the first time I met Eric Wainaina. And it was just a handshake of You were part hi. of the dancers? I wasn't part of the dancers, but we were all hanging out together. I get. So it was just a few select four dancers who went and performed for him. And then he came down and was like, thank you guys. And I was like, hi, my name is Kami. Wow, this is pretty cool. Um, but come into your relationship with Eric because <laughs> currently, right now, you do a lot been, with Eric. Yeah, we've been working quite a bit together. So um, after five he hours, after guys, he came hours. up after he <laughs> came up on stage after he, he came up off of the stage, we had two dance we had two performance sessions on the program. So he came off of the stage and then Olova went up, and Richie, it's the first time I went up on a stage and saw people as far as the eyes could see, as far as the eye could see. It was just people, people, people in Pala grounds and it just stretched for as far as you could see just lots and lots of people. It was wonderful. That was when Olova went truly mainstream. Truly mainstream. So by this point, I'm a bit of a celebrity at USIU because some people are like, yo, dude, I saw you at that gig. You're part of that dance group called Olova. We hardly ever see you on campus, but dude, I saw you at the club this weekend. And soon... All of us are hunkering down and we're realizing, yo, we're becoming more and more popular. We're becoming more, more and more popular. And I think for Oscar, he was like, I remember what happened when rap community got more popular. So it's like everything just became even more. We hunkered down, we became more insulated. We were cutting ourselves up more from people. Things were becoming a little bit more militant within the ministry just so that none of us would fall mm -hmm. or bring shame to the ministry because that was the last thing that Oscar wanted. Ha, ah, anyway. Our affiliation with church was still not very strong until we started being mentored by a pastor that had also come from uh, Glory Tabernacle GT. His name was Pastor Judah Kimanzi, who shares the last name with someone you've interviewed previously on this show. 
Gideon Kimanzi. Gideon Kimanzi is his younger brother. What? Yes. So his elder brother, Pastor Judah, became sort of like the patron pastor for all over. And therefore that meant we were hanging out with a lot of people that went to his church. And it was at this point when I met a young man called Maxi, uh, Eric Kitao. And Maxi was a Maxi. sort of... Maxi? Maxi, like Maxi. Maxi. Yeah, that's Maxi. Oh. Yeah, he was a good friend and sort of like protege of, uh, of Pastor Jay, Pastor Judah. And once when we were hanging outside after hours, I learned that Maxi works at a radio station, Nation FM. And the reason we knew this was because he granted us a couple of interviews as all over because we were organizing a concert. And the, con and the concert was called... Prepare for the... What was that concert called? Prepare for the spillage. Oh, gosh. And I think about it and I'm like, what? <laughs> This concert was called Prepare for the Spillage. It was our first ever concert. Remember, we'd been going around. We were earning a little bit of fame by this point, but we were still doing it by other people's standards. We hadn't put on a concert of our own, a dance concert. So he helped us do a bit of promo for it. The concert was a bit, quite a success. A lot of people came. It was the first time that they'd ever come to attend a concert for which it was just dance. There was not much singing. There was any, not, not much. What you're doing is you're coming to watch dance. So we had these extended choreography sessions, some of which were going to last up to 45 minutes of non-stop dancing. Yo. 45 minutes. And the good thing with that was that we were able to take that very same material and we became performance juggernauts because event organizers found that you can actually keep a crowd engaged for 40 minutes with one act. And that act is not going to sing a single word. So we're getting sets as long as, I mean, even an, even performers like, you know, Nameless who are on the come up at that point, or, and we're going to come to this movement that was called Ogopa a bit later on. Even before then, you still couldn't find an act, uh, 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 it was hard to find a performer that would get up on that stage and perform for 45 minutes of so music content. But we could go and dance for a clean 45 minutes. That was crazy. So suddenly we're putting this concert together and Eric says, I work at Nation FM. I can help you do a bit of the promo for it. I'll help you record a few promos and we'll put you in the classifieds and we'll get you a couple of interviews. It was really cool. And as we were doing this and as our media tour, and media tours even then weren't really a thing, as I started picking up speed, um, uh, one of my friends is like, yo, I can hook you up with an interview for with Jimmy Gathu, who was now a radio host of It's Not Homework. You know, I interviewed Joe Kali and he said that. And I was like, Jimmy Gathu was once on It's Not Homework. Yes, he was. He was the host of It's Not Homework. Do you know who he took over from? Bob Kyoko. No way. Who was a member of oh, Five Alive. Five Alive. Oh, actually, I remember Bob Kyoko. Bob Kyoko was a radio presenter. I remember Bob Kyoko, yes, being a radio presenter, but I didn't and know. And then he moved to Nation <coughs> after that. Oh, yes, he did. Yeah. Okay, so go on. So, <coughs> we end up, sorry, we end up on an interview with, um, with, 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 with Jimmy Gathu. At the same time, Pinye sort of gives his life to Christ, and so he says, I'll start playing a bit of gospel music in my stuff. And there's a you lot of Pinye? big... Yeah, Pinye. Can I tell you something? You know, you remember Pinye was, had a collective called the Scratchaholics? Yes. They had three hours, four hours on Nation FM. Yes. At the time when DJ Moz was doing Kubamba, DJ Pinye gave him a, a whole hour of gospel music on the Scratchaholics show. DJ Moz had a whole hour to himself on a DJ show run by one DJ for whom he was a collective, DJ Pinye and the Scratchaholics. Meaning, Moz, without being a member of the Scratchaholics, got more airtime than a lot of the Scratchaholics. That's insane. It's insane. That's insane. It's freaking insane. It's I've, freaking insane. I've known people that was, for years. I've that was, never that was, known this story. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 